In today's video, we're going to talk about a harmonic damper, a part you probably never think about on your diesel engine or even your gasoline engine. We're going to open this one up and we're going to see what it looks like inside and we're going to talk about torsional vibrations, the silent killer of some engines and various parts on them. I've been accused of over maintaining things before and that's not entirely inaccurate. I try to keep everything the way that it's supposed to be from the factory when new, if not better. And one of the areas that is oftentimes overlooked and especially when you're dealing with older, higher mile vehicles and engines, is a harmonic damper. A lot of times people think about harmonic dampers as just kind of the pulley on the front of an engine. Maybe it's there to create balance if you have an externally balanced engine. But in a lot of cases, these things are also here to absorb what are called torsional vibrations. I'll explain what torsional vibrations are in more detail in a minute, but what it essentially comes down to is vibrations that are created by the twisting force that is applied to a crankshaft as the individual cylinders fire. There are different things that it can impact torsional vibrations, including the number of cylinders, compression ratio, whether you have an engine that is a diesel versus a gasoline, but perhaps the most basic thing to consider with torsional vibrations is the amount of torque that the engine produces. So the higher torque the engine, and especially when you're getting into a diesel where you typically make that torque at a very low RPM, your torsional vibrations are going to tend to be worse and therefore you're going to put more stress on the harmonic damper. For most engines, especially gasoline ones, you can probably go the entire life of the vehicle without ever having to worry about this. But even on a gasoline engine, this can matter. A lot of gasoline engines have dampers that have uh, rubber in between an inner portion and an outer portion, and as that rubber hardens and, at, with age, you can eventually have either just poor balance in general, which can lead to more noticeable vibrations, but these also can come apart. In fact, some years ago I had a Mercedes E55 compressor with about 230,000 miles on it, and there were no indications of any problem with the damper whatsoever. Um, I sold the car just because I was ready to sell it, and actually a few days later the damper came apart on the new owner. I felt really, really badly about it, but there was no indication of a problem whatsoever. And a previous car that I had, a Mitsubishi 3000 GT VR4, uh, similarly I replaced the damper on that, and uh, when I took the old one off it was very evident just how cracked the rubber was. Now when you're talking about big diesel engines, you tend to have the dampers constructed a little bit more differently. So you don't see any rubber that's connecting an inner and an outer portion, and there isn't one. Uh, in fact, if you take a look at this and you feel it, this just feels like a big heavy piece of metal. And it is a big heavy piece of metal, but on the inside of this is actually a decent amount of silicone that is set up in such a way that it's going to help to absorb some of those vibrations. Now, that silicone is going to age not unlike rubber, and as it ages, it becomes less able to absorb those torsional vibrations and then uh, dampen them out to the rest of the engine, to the transmission, and then also to the accessories. This balancer came off the Caterpillar 3126B that was in my previous RV. And on that engine, uh, from the very beginning of when I had it, I noticed that the accessories that were belt driven were vibrating more than what they should be. I even had a couple of comments and videos about the accessories vibrating more than they should. What I did notice was I had a couple of bolts that were the lower bolts holding what the original air conditioning compressor on, which I later removed and replaced with an alternator. Uh, but whether it was the air conditioning compressor or the alternator, those bolts were just getting constantly hammered and I found them broken. I had to replace them repeatedly. They would get loose on their own over time, no matter what I did to them. In retrospect, th this damper was probably bad the entire time that I owned the RV, and it wasn't because of high miles. It only had about 84,000 miles on it when I bought it, but what had happened was I believe that the silicone inside this has aged and got to the point where it was no longer working. One of the reasons why this isn't thought about very much is because for most people it doesn't end up becoming an issue. I've never seen an automotive manual say that the harmonic damper should be replaced on any kind of a schedule, but when you get to the big diesels that you find like what's in my Prevo today or what's in a lot of semi trucks going down the road, most of them actually do have some kind of prescription time frame for when you're supposed to replace that damper. It's generally based off of miles, so something around the order of 500,000 miles, but I have also seen references to doing it based off of age at around the 20 year mark. Well, it was about the 20 year mark when I bought my previous RV and started having these problems with the original harmonic damper. 
My Prevo is 23 years old, and even though it only has 104,000 miles on it, I'm replacing that damper as well with a, one from Vibratech TBD. I'm going to do another video on that in the future, so keep an eye out for that. So let's go to the whiteboard for a minute to help visualize some of what's going on with torsional vibrations. So what even are torsional vibrations, and why are they something that you should consider or be concerned about? So what I've drawn here is just a standard XY graph where this is going to be where the y-axis is going to be torque x-axis is going to be degrees of rotation I've got 360 degrees for one revolution and 720 degrees for two revolutions remember in a four cycle engine you've got two revolutions for a complete cycle of all cylinders firing and when we think about engine torque we get a rating of torque at say 1550 foot-pounds that's what the series 60 in my Prevo is rated at or 860 foot-pounds of torque is what the 3126B in my old RV was rated at. And we tend to think about that torque being a constant line going across the engine rotations. And that's not at all what ends up happening. What this torque curve actually ends up looking like is a lot peakier. The valley, peak, and then... There you go. This isn't completely accurate, but the general concept applies. So basically what you've got is that in a six-cylinder, four-stroke engine, you've got in one revolution, three cylinders are firing. And so what you've got is you've got with each firing pulse, you've got a significant increase in force, then followed by some level of decrease in force after it reaches the peak. You've got a compression stroke that comes back up again, and you've got a peak and on a diesel especially, these peaks are going to be significantly higher because your peak combustion pressures are going to be higher. And so with that, when you're thinking about the crankshaft, each one of these firing pulses is going to be pushing against the rest of the crankshaft and causing a twisting motion. And that's what torsional vibrations are. So you're not getting this kind of a constant force that's going into the transmission through the rest of the drivetrain uh, or then out the front through the accessories, you're actually getting this, these significant pulses and then the average of those pulses comes out to your torque rating that you get on your engine. And there's different ways that we handle this. One of the ways is just with general mass and design of the components. Uh, a diesels especially, you tend to have a very heavy flywheel and a heavy flywheel is going to do a better job of absorbing and then kind of evening out these pulses, but a harmonic damper that's located typically on the front of a crankshaft is another important piece of this puzzle to try to handle these torsional vibrations. Torsional vibrations aren't something that you're going to be able to typically feel, although on my last RV when I changed the balancer I did notice an, inc an improvement in smoothness, uh, especially at idle, and I think that what was really happening there was that the torsional vibrations were causing an extra hammering on the rest of the accessories. If you look through some of my old videos on my previous RV and you see the engine idling, you'll notice that the accessories, when I first got it and throughout most of my ownership of it, actually vibrated quite a bit. And after I changed the harmonic damper, it was really evident just how much smoother the engine ended up being and specifically how much less the accessories were vibrating. So this does actually matter. You, the other area where you can have issues, and this may have applied on my previous RV as well, is that because the crankshaft is twisting more, that can impact your bearings and cause wear. I did replace the bearings on mine at about 100,000 miles, which is sooner than what you would normally expect to need to, and they definitely needed to be replaced. In some cases, especially on some of the larger Caterpillar engines, uh, there are cases of the crankshafts just outright snapping, and some people attribute that to torsional vibrations, and that can happen. So with that, let's get the balancer on the bandsaw, let's cut it open, and let's see what it looks like on the inside. All right, I've got this on the bandsaw, so now what I'm gonna do is turn it on. I've got this pretty much set up right in the center, so we're gonna get a good uh, profile cut of what exactly the inside of this looks like. Let's turn it on and see what it does.
I got this old damper from my 3126 cut apart now and let me get a little bit closer and you can kind of see the construction. So what you've got is essentially a metal ring that is inside the metal casing and you can see that on this side it's pretty well flush and then on this side you've got, well for one it's sticking out a little bit and actually if I push I can get it to move back and forth, see, getting it to do that. And then you can also see the silicone that is in there that is kind of connecting the one ring to the other. And so this actually, this makes a lot of sense if you think about how it's going to work because what you essentially have is the outer ring, which is connected to the crankshaft, is going to get a force and then that silicone is going to kind of act as a bit of a spring and then try to pull that inner ring around some more. So is this, now oh, I got this out the rest of the way. <clears throat> and most of the weight, I can tell you, is pretty well in this part, the, which makes sense because this is the solid piece of metal as opposed to the housing. Is the silicone old? Can I tell? Eh, I guess it's hard for me to say for sure whether this feels or looks degraded or not. Um, that came apart pretty easily, but uh, this is silicone. It is going to age, so it makes sense that both with wear, uh, and by wear I mean mileage, because essentially when you're having these two parts go against each other, there's going to be heat created from a level of friction and from a level of pulling and working on that silicone. So let me take a look at the other side here. <sighs> And you can see the same thing. Uh, I do find it kind of interesting how it seems like you've basically got the one side bigger than the other uh, opening wise. And I had not measured that. Um, oh, okay. Now I actually see how this works. And this was uh, something I had not thought about when I put this one on. So you've got these three flats. So one, two, and then the third one would be over here if you had the complete uh, setup. And these spots are a bit bigger, and so then that's where you've got some of that extra silicone in there that is helping to keep the inner ring and the outer ring connected. So now that we've cut open this damper and we've talked about torsional vibrations, I wanted to leave you with a few parting thoughts. The first thing is that this kind of silicone uh, coupled damper is one way of handling torsional vibrations, but it's not the only way. But ultimately, any of the kinds of damping systems that you see in use have a similar methodology behind them. They just go about them in a different way. Essentially, with a damper like this, what happens is when there's a pulse from the engine, it moves the housing of the damper, and then the silicone is then trying to pull the inner ring of the damper behind it. And because there's some level of friction between the inner ring, the outer ring, and the silicone, that's what produces heat. But early in my career, I worked on piston aircraft engines, and the way that they handle this is a little bit different, but again, the same idea. On piston aircraft engines, you had counterweights that were mechanically attached to the crankshaft. So then as the crankshaft got a pulse from the engine firing, counterweights would then move, and then as centrifugal force tried to get the uh, counterweights back out, they would end up putting some of that energy back into the crankshaft. The benefit of that kind of setup is that you don't end up creating heat from uh, dealing with the vibrations, but what does end up happening with that also is that they are more susceptible to going what's called out of tune due to transients, where you've got a fast uh, change in throttle either going on or going off. In a piston aircraft engine, that's generally not too big of a concern because you're operating at a constant throttle, but when you've got a road-going engine where you've got significant throttle changes all the time, 
it doesn't work as well, and that's why you don't see that in road-going engines. Another similar type that I've seen in use before is having a flywheel that has little pockets within it, and then you have uh, similarly masses that go within those pockets, and the pockets are kind of elongated or ovalized, such that centrifugal force is trying to make those weights go outward, and then as you've got these shocks from each engine pulse, the weights will move from one side to the other, and again, they'll put that energy back into the rotating assembly as centrifugal force pushes them outward. You see this sort of arrangement actually in certain production vehicles or an idea similar to that, like a dual mass flywheel, uh, such as what's on my one ton ram with the G56 manual transmission. Essentially, you've got the mass that's attached to the crankshaft and then you've got the mass that's attached to the clutch. And then those have some springs in between them. So the concept is similar to that. In that setup, that has more to do with trying to dampen out vibrations going into the transmission rather than on the engine side itself, but the same sort of general concept applies. Another thing I should mention is that a number of people don't believe that the silicone will age, and I could be wrong in saying that, I, that it does. Vibrotech TVD, who I got my new damper from for my Series 60, which I'll cover in another video, said that in their experience, they've actually run dampers that are 30 plus years old and they still behave as if they were new. So while I'm attributing some of the failure of this damper that we've cut open to age, it could also just be that that damper was subject to unusually high heat. Maybe something about the characteristics of the 3126 in a higher horsepower application. Uh, my previous RV had 330 horsepower, which for a 3126 is on the high side. Uh, also was rated at 860 foot-pounds of torque, again on the high side for a 3126. So the damper may have just been more undersized. The use of the RV may have had it in a high torque uh, position most of the time. The Allison transmission and that tended to shift very early and get it into a low RPM, high torque kind of regime. And those are the areas where torsional vibrations tend to be the worst. So my attributing this failure due to age could actually have to do with just heat generation that was due to the damper itself perhaps being undersized or maybe it just had to do with heat within the engine compartment. Regardless of whether it was age, use, heat, miles, whatever it was, I can say with certainty that the damper that I took out of my 3126 was in fact bad. So what does this mean for you and your engine? First off, if the manufacturer does have a recommendation for when you should change out your harmonic damper, make sure that you do it within that time frame. If there's no specific recommendation, take a look at various telltale signs. Are you having more vibration than you think you should be? Are you seeing your accessories vibrate in a way that they probably are not supposed to be? Have you found bearing wear earlier than what you would otherwise expect? If you're seeing things like this, you may need to replace your harmonic damper. Unfortunately, there's not an easy test that you can perform to determine conclusively whether your damper is any good or not. So this is something of a judgment call, and my general recommendation is when in doubt, it's better to replace it than have to spend a lot of money on an expensive repair. Not that a new damper is cheap per se, but it's cheaper than having to replace your engine. I hope you found this video useful and interesting. Leave any questions down below in the comments, and as always, thanks for watching.